So you know now about uh, time frequency decomposition via complex Morley wavelet convolution. One of the main advantages of using uh, complex Morley wavelets for time frequency decomposition of uh, neural time series data is that it has very good uh, temporal precision. So um, uh, wavelet convolution is very good at uh, localizing frequency characteristics in time with you know, arguably kind of the highest precision uh, that you can get with time frequency analysis methods. Uh, but in fact, uh, this is not only an advantage, this can also be a disadvantage. So the temporal precision might be so high that uh, if some events are not really temporally very precise, you might, uh, you might just kind of fail to capture them using uh, wavelet convolution. And so in particular, I'd like to get back to this um, distinction between time-locked and non-time-locked activity, which I've mentioned in a previous lecture. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, time frequency analyses or time frequency power is robust to uh, phase-locked or non-phase-locked activity. As long as the activity is roughly time-locked, time frequency power is very good at extracting those dynamics from the signal. And then I discussed this issue of non-time-locked activity. And here, time frequency power uh, via complex Morley wavelet convolution is, is going to be OK at extracting these, uh, these signal characteristics, as long as it is not really um, extremely non-time-locked. So here you can see in this example, the dynamics are non-time-locked to the activity, but there is a lot of overlap in all the trials. And so you see you know, there's still a pretty decent representation here in the um, time frequency power. But the more non-time-locked these dynamics are relative to stimulus onset or relative to each other, the harder it's going to be to quantify these characteristics in the signal, particularly at the trial average level. This is usually not so much of a problem or not so much of a concern for uh, lower frequency activity because lower frequencies um, tend to be a little bit more uh, broad. They tend to be more uh, distribu um, uh, yeah, sort of uh, sluggish in their uh, responses. Um, but this is uh, more of a concern for higher frequencies like gamma frequency, for example, where something that you often see in empirical data, particularly at the level of uh, recording from outside the head, so EEG and MEG, is that uh, you don't often see that there is a uh, very high uh, continuous, uh, or con I should say continuously high power gamma. What you see more often is that the gamma seems to be um, coming in, in, these, uh, in bursts. Sometimes these bursts are, are more uh, temporally reliable and they are uh, related to lower frequency rhythms, as we would call um, cross-frequency coupling. Um, but either way, these uh, the the lack of of um, yeah the 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 less that these uh, bursts of gamma are really time locked to stimulus onset, uh, the harder it's going to be to quantify the signal. Um, and so this is one of the primary motivations for applying multi taper analyses to uh, time series data. <clears throat> so here I'm kind of uh, rephrasing the, the problem now. So imagine you are looking for gamma, let's say you have some hypothesis about um, gamma activity. It's a visual processing experiment and you want to look for uh, visual gamma. In a normal uh, um, time frequency analysis with wavelet convolution, you can see that the higher frequency activity tends to get very temporally precise. And so at the trial average level, you might see some um, uh, bursts of gamma, but you can imagine that if these, if the gamma activity is coming in bursts, um, it's going to be difficult to um, average these across trials. So the idea of multi taper is to sacrifice a little bit of the uh, temporal precision in order to increase the signal to noise ratio in the frequency domain. And so now, so this was the trial average. So now imagine we look at three individual trials. And so here we see that the, so there's no x-axis, uh, but you know, imagine this is like 40 hertz or something. So here 
at this time point after stim onset, uh, we can see that there is some gamma. See here, there's a few bursts of gamma. Here, I don't know, maybe there's a little weak out. And if anything, a suppression here and here there's some gamma. But these are, are not, at least in trial two, not really all perfectly lined up in such a way that we would expect to get a really nice uh, representation at the trial average level. Here you see another example. So here we see, you know, a little bit of gamma and, uh, and here and here, this is just blue actually. So if anything, it's a suppression of gamma. And here we see, you know, this is a nice little uh, burst of gamma. And there's one here a little bit earlier, but you can already see that lining these up uh, exactly in time is basically going to average these things out. And so wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to um, reduce the temporal precision to include, uh, but increase our signal to noise ratio to include this burst and this burst into the same kind of uh, uh, measurement of gamma. And again, this is the idea of uh, multi-taper. Okay, so here's how the multi-taper analysis works. We start with something called Slapian tapers. Now you already know from the uh, lecture on the short time Fourier transform that it's important to taper the, uh, the data before computing the FFT. Um, the idea of multi-taper is, as you might imagine from the title, uh, to use multiple tapers. So we don't just use one taper, we use many tapers. And what's advantageous about this sequence of tapers, these are called Slapian tapers, <coughs> is that all of these uh, tapers are orthogonal to each other. This means that they, that they can provide uh, independent estimates of the spectral content of the signal within this time window. So here we have several tapers, and we have one snippet of EEG data, and this would be 100 milliseconds long, or you know whatever the time window is. And now the idea is to um, create, uh, you know, in this case, six time series uh, that are defined by taking the exact same data and tapering them using these six different tapers. So we have six tapers one time series, and now we get six uh, tapered time series. And you can already see that they concentrate uh, the energy of the signal at different time points, right? So this taper will allow us to reconstruct features of the signal that are present here and here, so towards the edges, whereas this taper, which looks a bit more like the short time Fourier transform, um, has no representation of the signal over here and over here at the edges. And now by averaging these all together, if there is a burst of gamma that's happening over here, uh, that's going to be able to kind of sneak its way into the estimate of activity happening at the center of this time point. Okay, so now we have these multiple um, uh, snippets uh, resulting from tapering, uh, applying multiple tapers to the same data. And from these, now we take an F of T of each of these, uh, these tapered uh, time series snippets. And that gives us six different estimates of the spectral content of the signal uh, from this time window. And now we have these, um, these uh, different estimates of the spectral content, and we average these together. We average all these together, and that gives us one estimate, which is higher signal to noise because we are averaging more um, uh, orthogonal estimates of spectral content of the signal into one uh, to total estimate. And you can contrast this with the short time Fourier transform where there's only uh, the same data snippet would only get one uh, taper applied to it, so a Han window, for example. So and if you took the, uh, well, if you tapered this signal and took the Fourier transform of that tapered signal, you would see this. So now you can compare these two. Um, and I think this really shows the difference between the multi-taper and the short time Fourier transform in terms of the results. The multi-taper results tend to be more smoothed. Uh, they tend to be a little bit smeared out, uh, but they are higher signal to noise. And so here, you know, whether these two separate peaks 
uh, up here at these two frequencies is meaningful. You know, probably if you have extremely high quality data, maybe, you know, these would be meaningful, but most likely, you know, you would say these two peaks are really probably just coming from one uh, one sort of feature, and this is just a little bit of noise that caused the dip down here. So in that case, you might say that this is a higher signal to noise estimate, particularly for the higher frequency characteristics compared to the um, short time Fourier transform. So I hope that explanation is clear. This is another way of looking at this uh, procedure. So we start with the same snippet of EEG data, and then we can go, and this is what we discussed in, uh, in the, the previous lecture on the short time Fourier transform. We take one taper, we, we taper the data once, compute the power spectrum, uh, and then we have the power spectrum. And with multi-taper, we take the same signal, we taper it multiple times, we get multiple tapered signals, and then we extract the power spectrum several times, and then we average all of these together. And then you can compare uh, this to this. Okay, so let's see what this looks like in MATLAB. Um, to, uh, to generate the um, Slapian uh, tapers, you need this MATLAB function called DPSS. And this function DPSS is in the um, signal processing toolbox. So if you don't have the signal processing toolbox, unfortunately, you can just watch and, uh, and uh, yeah, well, just sort of uh, learn. Um, but uh, in order to run this analysis, you would actually need to have the signal processing toolbox. Okay, so here we are just going to extract um, uh, several tapers. I think DPSS stands for discrete prolate uh, spherical, um, uh, I forget what it stands for, but that's okay, we can look it up later. So here you see the different tapers. This is basically just what I uh, showed in the PowerPoint slide. <coughs> Here's where we are going to compute the um, time frequency power analysis using the multi-taper uh, method. So first I'll just run it and then I'll go through. So there are several parameters that are uh, basically the same parameters that you would use in the short time Fourier transform. And in fact, in these cases, I picked the, um, the parameters to be exactly the same as in the code for the short time Fourier transform so that we can compare the results directly. So the same electrode, the same time window, and, and the same uh, time parameters and so on. So let's see. Um, this stuff you can go through line by line. It's basically things you've seen before. Here, the loop that starts on line 45, this is the critical loop. Uh, so far up here, this looks similar to uh, the loop for the short time Fourier transform. We are going to be looping over um, time windows. And here what we are going to do is have another loop that goes over the tapers because we want to repeat this procedure for all the different tapers. And so here within this loop for each taper, we extract the EEG data. This is a longish line of code, but um, it's not so dense. So we just take the EEG data from this particular channel, from this time point, and then minus um, half the time window to this time point and plus half the time window, all of the trials. And here's where we are doing the uh, tapering. So I'm using this BSX fun function to uh, taper this temporary uh, uh, matrix of data. So you can see this is a time by trials matrix um, and multiplying it by each taper. And now here we compute the F of T of this data. Um, we compute the uh, power uh, and then we add, uh, here we compute the power um, and then here we take the average over the second dimension which is trials. Now here you can see we are adding up the um, the power values uh, with each iteration in this loop, we keep adding the power values uh, over and over again. And then here, when we finally get to entering the data into the time frequency matrix, we divide by the number of tapers, which is the number of iterations in this loop. Um, and that gives us the average. So here we are summing the power over all of the tapers 
and then we divide by the number of tapers. Here again, uh, we are applying a uh, decibel normalization, and then we plot the results. So it's actually not so difficult here. It's not so uh, involved. So here you can see the results. Uh, before discussing them, we can go back to this code for the short time Fourier transform. Run this, and this should look familiar if you saw the previous lecture. Um, and now it's quite interesting to compare these two results. So there's a couple of striking differences. One striking difference is when you look at the lower frequency dynamics. And the short term uh, Fourier transform showed very clearly that there are two temporally distinct uh, dynamics happening here. Whereas the multi-taper analysis kind of shows one long, smooth uh, dynamic. This is generally something you see with the uh, with multi-taper analyses that because you are sacrificing temporal precision for um, increased signal to noise ratio the sacrifice or the decrease in temporal precision tends to be pretty extreme at lower frequencies and so pretty often uh, people don't even interpret the results of a multi-taper analysis below like around 30 hertz or sometimes 20 hertz so in practice, you know, you probably wouldn't even interpret any results below this line here for the multi-taper analysis. But here you really see that we are sacrificing temporal precision in order to increase the signal to noise. Another difference is that if you look here in this kind of um, uh, low gamma range, with the short time Fourier transform, you see these little, you know, this little kind of confetti stuff which is actually very weak. So the, I don't have a color bar plotted here, but it was minus two to plus two decibels. So this is around two decibel, and this is maybe half a decibel or maybe smaller. I'm sure that the, all these little features are would not be statistically significant and they're likely to be uh, just noise in particular because they occur before time zero. And what you see here in the multi-taper analysis is all that stuff gets smoothed out. So we've boosted the signal to noise ratio at these higher frequencies and that means we've gotten rid of a lot of this confetti stuff which i would say is a good thing because probably um, all of these things are just uh, noise anyway and you can see you know that these these features kind of uh, got merged into one feature so we've lost some precision but we've increased the signal to noise ratio So the basic mechanics of uh, multi-taper analysis are, are not really difficult. Uh, and I hope you see that this is basically how uh, the multi-taper analysis works. Um, in practice, when people really apply multi-taper analyses, that are, there are um, uh, advances in, there have been advances in the use and development of uh, multi-taper analysis that provide uh, better frequency precision with higher frequencies. And so this code, you know, just straight out of the box like this, I wouldn't really recommend using this code in practice for real data analysis uh, because it's not hard to, um, to adjust the analysis to get better uh, results and, and more uh, accurate results. One thing, for example, is that I just chose this the number of tapers arbitrarily to make it three. You can change this number around if you want. Um, and uh, but there are ways to estimate the appropriate amount of the appropriate number of tapers, which um, is uh, which will define the amount of smoothing in your result. If you would like to apply the multi-taper analysis for your data analyses, um, then I'd recommend using the field trip uh, toolbox for. MATLAB. It's a free toolbox and uh, you can just Google field trip uh, data analysis MATLAB or something like that and you'll find it. Um, I think that's the toolbox that has the most uh, kind of active development of, uh, of the advanced use of multi-taper for data analysis. So, uh, but the main point of this lecture was to help you understand why people apply the multi-taper analysis and in what situations it's useful. And, and I hope you found that part informative.